Every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Kim Jones, a member of the marketing team for Balchem. Rumen health can have a big impact on productivity and profitability in your herds. And though there are many ways to evaluate changes in the rumen, many times we're looking for a quick check without invasive or expensive testing. For today's Real Science mm -hmm. webinar, we're going to get down and dirty and talk about manure. As we all know, you can tell a lot about the health and well being of animals by evaluating manure. Dr. Mary Beth Hall from the USDA is going to walk us through the many things we can learn through manure evaluation. Dr. Hall earned her BS and MS degrees in animal science at Virginia Tech and then spent seven years working for industry and cooperative extension on nutrition and management with commercial dairy herds in New York State. She then returned to Cornell University for a PhD in animal science. Dr. Hall's first faculty appointment was at the University of Florida Department of Dairy and Poultry Sciences as an assistant professor of dairy cattle nutrition and extension and research. In 2004, Dr. Hall joined the USDA Agricultural Research Services at the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center in Madison, Wisconsin, as a research scientist, where she still serves today. She is also an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Hall, the floor is now yours. Good morning. Uh, talking about manure evaluation is about as generic a thing as you could probably probably address. Um, and, and the topic today, manure evaluation for reading your cows, it doesn't just happen. Uh, this is going to go over actually probably some decades uh, of looking at manure <laughs> and, and working through what can it tell us about what's going on that might actually matter as we're trying to diagnose what's going on on a farm and improve on a situation? I mean, the whole thing about um, what we do, whether, whether we're a farmer, a veterinarian, a nutritionist, uh, from industry serving the industry, is getting enough information on the farm in context, not just single bits and pieces that we think are interesting, but, but get enough total information in context from enough different angles to make sense of what's going on so that we can bet, come up with some better solutions to meet the goals of that particular farm. I mean, so when we're walking through and evaluating a herd, there are some things that we do as a matter of course. I mean, this is either checking up that things are all as well or in problem solving. I mean, with the cows, we're looking at body condition score, uh, coat, lameness, rumination. Um, for feeds, inspecting the feeds themselves, looking for mold, dust, spoilage, analysis, consistency. How well are the diets mixed? Are there diets actually there for the cows to eat? Or, or do we have an empty bunk syndrome? Yes, we do look at the bunk. Um, and has the feed heated or does it look clean and fresh, well mixed and so forth? The cows need clean, fresh and available water. The facility is comfortable, clean and ventilated. And how are the employees interacting with the cows as well? But there's something else we evaluate as well. And um, quite honestly, yeah, it manure doesn't just happen there's a fair amount that goes on behind the scenes in the cow that dictates what we end up walking through. See, if you look at manure in the context of all of these other things that we evaluate on a farm, manure gives us insights into the interaction between the cow and her diet. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard it before that on the farm, 
the cows are always right. And actually, they are the only ones that are always right, because what they show us is always going to be the truth for how they are working with their diet, their environment, and so forth. And manure can just give us insights into what that interaction is. Okay. Uh, I work for the Dairy Forage Research Center. Pray tell, what does manure have to do with forage in my job? Forage is the main contributor to the diet of the physical form that is going to make a ration work for a ruminant, for a dairy cow. And if you take a look at the physical form of whether it's alfalfa or corn silage or something like wheat straw, it's fibrous, it's, it, it has a coarse physical form, coarser than anything else we're gonna get in the, in the diet. Um, and it's more slowly digested coming from, from neutral detergent fiber um, with the plant structure making up this coarser material. And so this physical form is going to have an impact in the diet that these finer particle sizes and probably higher digestibilities will not. This physically effective form of the diet, going from something that's really fine to, to medium to, to rather coarse, enhances rumen function. It can increase the degree to which a cow ruminates. It is going to affect the retention in the rumen of the entire diet, which is going to affect how well it digests. And so it affects passage. It can reduce the risk that the cow has for digestive upset, which for cow performance, for cow well-being, for cow health, we absolutely wish to avoid. And put in general terms, adding the larger physical particle size, adding the forages into the diet in the right amounts balanced with the other diet components allows rations to work so that the cow can be productive and healthy. Okay, still haven't told you what this has to do with, with manure, but we'll get there. Um, physical form in the rumen, you know, those larger particles that the cow consumes, the typically from forages, um, it can make a mat or, or a matrix in the rumen that holds both that fiber and other feed particles in the rumen to be digested. I mean, so here we have, have the rumen, there's a gas space up top, here we have the digesta, perhaps a rumen mat, although sticking my arm into cannulated cows, this may extend from top to bottom with, with coarse feed. And then this is the omasal orifice that the feed leaves the rumen through. When we take these large particles, well, when the cow, consumes the large particles that are in her diet. Those particles are gradually broken down through chewing and through microbial activity, digesting it, fermenting it, until they're broken down small enough that they can leave through the omasal orifice. The longer the time that a feed, that material is in the rumen, gives it more time to be ruminated and broken down and fermented to produce the microbial products that provide the main sources of the cow's nutrition uh, in terms of energy and protein. Um, and I tell you what, the amount of time that material spends in the rumen and its breakdown also affects the size of particles that we see in the manure. It can also affect the pH because with more rumination, with a balance between, let's say, starch and, and neutral detergent fiber and so forth, you're going to keep a pH in the range where you're going to get better degradation in the rumen, better digestion, better rumen function. Okay, so I told you that feed can digest in the rumen, but it digests elsewhere in the cut as well, and obviously. In the rumen, with fermentation by the mixed rumen microbes, they can digest protein, and they can digest carbohydrates, the neutral detergent fiber, 
and the non-fiber carbohydrates such as starches and sugars, pectins, the, the soluble fiber. Feed that leaves the rumen or microbial microbes that leave the rumen that pass to the small intestine then get subject to enzymatic digestion of the cow's own making. In the small intestine, there's digestion of the true protein that came from the rumen, from either feed or microbes, starch, and lipids, fats. Now, whatever isn't digested in the small intestine passes to the cecum in the large intestine, where we have fermentation again. There, there can be digestion of crude protein or the same carbohydrates, actually the same materials that could have been fermented in the rumen. But I tell you what, depending where we see the fermentation going on in the rumen or in that hindgut, the fates of the products can be different. For example, the organic acids that are produced from fermentation by rumen microbes, uh, primarily, let's say, from the carbohydrates, the acetate, the propionate, the butyrate that are produced, that are very important energy sources to the cow. If they're produced in the rumen, they're going to be absorbed and used by the cow for energy. And same thing happens in the hindgut, in, in the cecum and large intestine. But one of the things to consider is that in the rumen, we have better buffering through, um, through the cow's saliva, which brings bicarb into the rumen to help maintain a better rumen pH. We don't have the same degree of buffering in that hindgut, and so the pH of the acid can have a bit different effect if too much is produced if too much acid is produced there. Microbial protein. If it's produced in the rumen, the microbes can die and recycle in the rumen, or they can pass to the small intestine and be digested and absorbed and give a very important source of true protein, high quality amino acids to meet the cow's nutrient requirements. If that microbial protein is produced from fermentation in the hindgut, it goes out in the feces. Okay, gas, carbon dioxide and methane as the less fermentation product will cover. In the rumen, if it's produced, she belches or she bloats. Um, belching is the, is the common and normal one. If the gas is produced in the hindgut, that goes out with the feces and it affects some of the way manure looks as well. So, so the part of the bottom line is whether we see digestion in the rumen or we see it in the large intestine and cecum. A shift in the site of digestion changes the nutrient supply to the cow and causes some of the changes we see in the appearance of the manure, including some symptoms of ruminal acidosis and digestive upset. Um, because if you've ever thought about it, why on earth should something that we perceive as ruminal acidosis show up a, as a problem in the manure? And, and part of it is that we might have a lot more involvement of the entire gut than just the rumen. And, and so the problem might be bigger than you thought. Anyway, to move on. Okay, first thing first. Here's the good stuff. And, and you're probably going to see more pictures of manure today than, than you have in some time. Um, with lactating cows, when we're looking at manure that's a decent consistency, that looks good. I mean, it's on the soft side, but it forms up. It doesn't splatter. Um, I think if you've listened to Mike Hutchins, he would talk about a double dip <laughs> or a single dip. Um, it's formed up. It's soft. Um, I would perceive these two as normal. But again, before I continue, anything I show you with manure, you've got to put in context with everything else you've looked at on the farm. Okay, now we get into the not normals. If you take a look at these two samples, you see a lot of gas bubbles. These are not normal. This, this manure was downright foamy. Um, and if you see a cow defecating this manure, it can come out as a sort of solid looking stream be, because it is foamy. And 
typically, as best we can tell, we'd attribute this to excess fermentation in the hindgut that created acid, gas, and a kind of matrix that held those gas bubbles in place. Bottom line, when, when I see this is I'm thinking the gut is not functioning properly. We're not getting the digestion we want in the rumen. And the feed doesn't appear to have digested where we think it should have or where we wanted it to in the rumen. Also not normal, diarrhea. Um, it's a sign typically of ruminal acidosis or digestive upset or of eating spoiled feed and can be caused by disease such as uh, winter dysentery. But when it's based on an issue with the diet, it also gets into feed being digested in a location where it shouldn't have, that the rumen wasn't functioning well, and so things didn't ferment as completely there, as well there as they should have. And this, this is a piece of spoilage that was in the feed bunk on one of my research trials uh, back in Florida. Um, in this particular study, the herb manager came up to me when, when we were setting things up, and he says, Dr. Hall, did you formulate the diets to reduce the cow's production? <laughs> and I said, Dale, thank you so much. Um, and, when, and when I was walking the cows in their pen on their individual diets, what I found is that there was a lot of variability amongst the cows from diarrhea to perfectly normal manure. And I found this in the feed bunk. And what we had was a drive over silo, bunk silo at the time. And the crew had been doing a phenomenally good job of cleaning the spoilage off of the top so it wasn't fed. But as we got to the back end of the silo, there was some of that material there that was making its way into the diet. And rather what it looked like is any cow that drew the short straw and ate some of this ended up with some some diarrhea. And so once we cleared that spoilage off the bunk and made sure it did not make its way into the rations, everything cleared up and the cows also produced better. So, okay, also not normal is undigested feed. I mean, you, odds are you might find some in the manure, especially as you have high producing cows that are eating a lot of feed and have a higher rate of passage. Um, you might find some undigested feed in the manure, but if you start seeing coarse particles like these pieces of corn, it begs the question, do you need a finer grind on the grain that you're feeding? Um, this, uh, this is an example of corn grain that had been put through sieves. And these particle sizes that you see here are typically like this number eight or this number 16 or number four. They're gritty, they're hard. And if you don't have enough forage in the diet with adequate particle size and adequate rumination to be able to allow that selective retention in the rumen to get these better digested, you're more likely to see this. Um, this can even happen with your corn silage. If it's not properly processed, if you have coarse particles, and especially if the grain is on the drier side, more likely to see this. You can resolve that by grinding the, the grain you feed more, more finely. With the corn silage, you're in a tougher situation and you may have to supplement more, uh, more grain to be able to get the same level of starch and so forth that's digestible in the rumen and to the animal. Now, I was at one meeting and um, showed these slides, and one of the attendees suggested that you might also see this when you have slug feeding. If the animals are taking in a whole pile of feed all at once, the odds that some of it's going to pass might be higher, and you might get some more undigested feed passing through. That was one suggestion. And so perhaps one of the things you need to look at are do you have adequate bunk space? Are the animals slug feeding? And how can your management address this? Okay. Once upon a time, um, I remember being told repeatedly 
that when you saw corn come through, don't worry, the, the starch was digested out of that. Well, we've got tests now that would suggest that's not the case. But, but if you're trying to give people a hands-on explanation that no, it didn't get well digested, you can go back to something you probably learned in grade school <laughs> that, that actually can give a, a good show and tell. Tincture of iodine, when it comes in contact with cornstarch or, or with starch, gives a, a blue-black color, whereas on anything else, it'll just be something tan. So I, wearing gloves, I fished some whole soybeans, uh, roasted soybeans or halves that came through in manure, and I fished out some corn that came through in the manure, and I put tincture of iodine on them. The soybean, you'll see, they just stay brown. But the corn, because there was still starch in it, turns this blue black. That's indicative that starch came through. Um, there are other tests for starch digestibility at this point that look at the starch in manure. Uh, more technical tests, more quantitative. This is qualitative and, and a show and tell that says this is feed that the cow did not get in, any nutritional value from, for, for what remained in the manure. Okay, there will be undigested feed particles can get through in the manure, but you really don't wanna be able to ID them. Um, you know, when I, this picture that I took of manure that shows a piece of green grass that that cow managed to get a hold of that came through green. This piece of corn sheet, stalk sheath uh, that came through you're not supposed to be able to ID feed that's in the manure, whether it's whole lint and condensate, citrus pulp, or so forth. Um, that would suggest that it was escaping the rumen too quickly to be well digested. And you probably need to look at sorting and you need to look at uration formulation. And do you have enough forage, enough effective fiber to get things well digested in the rumen? Okay, other not normals in general. If the manure looks paste, and this is in lactating dairy cows. If the manure looks pasty like this, if it's splattered and kind of shiny like this, if it's this dry, not normal. You need to evaluate what else is going on. And if it's this dry, um, I'd look at minerals and I'd look at protein because um, it might suggest perhaps um, that the animals aren't drinking as much water as perhaps they might, which could be related to those two. But again, it's just a, a thought and you need to look at the rest of the diet, the rest of the management and situation to get a context for what's going on. Okay, another not normal is lots of variation in a given pen of cows. And maybe about 5% of the cows are gonna have manure that doesn't look like their compatriots in the same pen with cows that are on the same diet. They should generally have similar manure as they're responding to the diet. If not, they're sorting their feed or something else is going on. And you have to go look to find out what it is. Okay, sorting. You know cows have very few hobbies. Um, let me think, they check gates, they'll drop a pile of manure in the milking parlor, and they sort their feed. And if you walk into a barn and you see cows put their nose down, move it from side to side, and then dive deeper and create these cow holes in the bunk, they are doing their level best to sort their feed. And a great quote from Lou Armitano, now our emeritus professor at University of Wisconsin. If a feed particle is longer, then a cow's nose is wide. She can probably sort it. And so you need to get particle size, maybe an inch to two inches long, mixed in a moist or a, a diet that holds together by virtue of what feeds you included in it um, to reduce the potential for them to sort. And you also need to put the diets together so you don't help the cows sort from the get go. This is a an inadvertently partially mixed ration where the hay wasn't properly mixed in. So this cow was eating this wad of alfalfa hay and this cow was choosing to go for the rest of the TMR. 
when cows can sort their feed, what you've done is you've turned every single cow into her own independent nutritional consultant. And I swear to you, cows are not good nutritional consultants. Um, they can eat themselves sick. Um, I've seen cows select for grain. I have seen cows select for forage. And in either case, they're not going to get the balanced diet that they need. So again, one more thing to, to be concerned about when you're looking at manure and how it got that way. Okay, another not normal are mucin and calves. All right, if you walk into a barn, okay, first things first, these can show up in any consistency of manure, okay? If you drag your toe across a cow pie and something moves after your toe has gone past that portion of the cow pie, it's either this or you need to step away from that cow pie because Lord knows what's in there. But but I would put odds that it's probably a mucin cast. And if with gloved hands, you fish these out of the cow pie and rinse them with water, this is what you'll see. It kind of looks like the lining of the intestine, but, but it's not. It is a sign of past damage to the large intestine. It can be brown, it can be gray or almost black. It can be many inches long, or it can be fragments. And where this comes from is damage to the lining of the intestine. Um, this is normal lining to the large intestine where you have a normal layer of cells. They migrate up and they gradually shed off from the top. But if you get damage that can happen from acid created from too much hindgut fermentation, and what Henriksen et al. in 1989 suggested with some of this work was it also might come from um, endotoxin. You get damage to the top layer of the large intestine. That skin, that epithelium, those cells get shed off, get damaged off. And this is when you get mucin secreted. We don't know the time frame of when this happens relative to when the mucin casts come out in the manure, but it is an indicator, not normal, um, of something of damage to, to the lining in the large intestine, typically related to diet. Okay, another not normal would be fibrin casts, but these, okay, ah, these, you can't just keep them in water because they'll eventually disintegrate. You can keep them in alcohol and then rehydrate them if you want them for show and tell. Um, point of interest. Okay, fibrin casts are a lot tougher in texture than mucin casts and a lot rarer, but it's still a sign of past damage to the large intestine. The only time I've ever seen these was when an animal got into some very spoiled feed, I have no idea what kind of toxins were in it, and she shed this out a couple days later. Okay, last portion of the talk is on looking at particle size. Uh, this is something that I worked on back at University of Florida. And this is the, the kit that we used. Um, yeah, first things first, for, for the crew I had doing this, we, we, we got t-shirts. Um, they were sought after. At any rate, <laughs> A, a, a simple kitchen screen. There, there are other screens that are out there. The, the whole thing is you want to be able to screen manure so you can look at how the particle size appears. Okay. We used a kitchen screen with about 1 16th inch or 1.6 millimeter openings. And I tell you, if you take this out of your kitchen, do not put it back. That would be rude. Um, and the next meal you eat may, may use it. Um, latex gloves, a sleeve for getting manure if you need it, and then sample cups. So I tell you, and in our case for research, a Sharpie marker so we can identify who, who the sample came from. In a pinch, you can use a red beer cup. Blue is possible too, whatever color doesn't matter. You can cover it with a latex glove to keep it from spilling in the cup holders in your truck. Um, you might fill it about half full. The, the key is as you walk through the herd, you end up taking samples that give you an idea of the diversity of the manure that's out there. Don't just pick the bad ones. Don't just pick the good ones. 
And then you take it back over to the barn. And this is me um, as professor. I was the one who got to use the holes and either my technician or a grad student was holding the screen. You rinse the sample into the cup, excuse me, into the kitchen screen. You rinse it through until the water runs pretty clear. You'll be losing a lot of really fine particles of fiber and all of the matrix that is keeping you from seeing what's going on. And you rub your hand over it so that you can clear the screen and get it to rinse better. And so finally, you can see the feed particles that came through the cow undigested um, to take a look at particle size and what exactly is there. Now, at this point, you might also see some clay-like balls that are not normal. As near as we've been able to find out, those might get formed up in the abomasum, not dead certain, but they don't contain fiber. They, they're more like microbial matter and um, perhaps mucus. Um, but again, they show up when things are not normal. When the veterinarians tell me they see them when there might be some digestive issues. At any rate, and to clean the screen, you just flip it backwards and rinse it out. Okay, what can you see when you do this? Um, these are two manure samples from two manure samples that we we screened, we rinsed and dried that I picked up in a fresh pen. This particular sample came from one of the beautifully formed normal cow pies, and this was in diarrhea, bubbly, not, not good looking. Good ruminal retention that gives better digestion also gives you these fine particles. When the rumen isn't working well, when the cows are sorting, you get less ruminal retention, you get less digestion, and you can get some fairly large particles passing out of the rumen, and this is not normal, okay? These cows, two cows are on the same diet. They obviously weren't reacting the same. Um, you really don't wanna see particles in the manure, not lots of particles, longer than maybe about a half inch, uh, a centimeter or so. Um, a few is okay. You don't get really upset, but but be careful for gross. In so many in so many ways, you could interpret that word for gross changes in, in particle size. You look for coarse, undigested feed. And, and by the way, I don't want anybody asking me why we were feeding pennies to cow. No, I, I put this in each of the slides so that people would have a a marker for what size particles we were looking at. Um, having cottonseed come through with the lint still on. In, in this particular diet, we needed to get more forage into the diet so that we had enough selective retention in the rumen to get feed digested. And you'll notice there, it, it looks, ah, the particle size isn't bad, some coarse pieces. But this was bothersome. The, at the very least, the lint should be fermented off. Okay, this was in a pool of bubbly diarrhea. Again, if you just, when I just looked at the manure there on the floor of the freestall, I wouldn't have expected this, but incredibly coarse material coming through. You don't see much grain, lots of fiber. And one thing that struck me was that we had a piece of hay that came through that was about six inches long. That's ridiculous. The, this is not normal. We, it goes back to needing to take a look at how we're doing in the diet for the forage that the animals need and the overall balance to keep them healthy, keep them ruminating, keep the fun, rumen function good so they can use their diet. Okay, course undigested feed three. Back in the days before corn processors were popular, Okay, you can see a piece of corn leaf here that came through still green. When you see material in the feces, typically you would, if the rumen is functioning well, you shouldn't see much green color that you'd recognize uh, unless you're out on pasture, unless the cows are on pasture, um, maybe with high alfalfa silage diets, a darker color. But, but what you see here is a lot of corn that came through intact because these kernels weren't even really nicked. 
And so they slid through the rumen. Um, and milk production increased when we added ground corn to this ration. I mean, so when you're looking at undigested feed coming through, whether it's that coarsely ground material that was dry and hard and got through the system, or you have unprocessed corn grain, um, this can actually reduce the digestibility of the diet, reduce how well the cow can produce on that particular diet. Okay, walking the cows. What you want to do when you're looking at manure is get an idea of the variation in groups, between groups, between rations. I mean, I typically sampled four to six pies per group for particle size. And again, about 5% of the manure will not look like the others. What One of the things you really don't want to see is you can see this cow that was walking away was practicing her cursive writing skills. Take a look to see for consistency while you're out there. Do things look normal? Okay. And I tell you, um, the manure evaluation, it's a valuable piece of information, but it, in my opinion, I, I look at it as qualitative, not quantitative. You, manure prop may well vary somewhat over the course of 24 hours. And for looking at what you're sampling, you don't know exactly what this represents versus what you sampled, okay? Um, out of the total quantity of manure produced. So what I'm showing you today, use this information qualitatively um, to get an idea of the cow's interaction with their diet. Other things to look for while you're out there that are gonna relate to what the manure looks like. If cows are having digestive upset, and, and again, total track, not just rumen, they're going to be eating more dirt or salt or bicarb. Keep an eye on that if you have those materials out for the cows to free choice. If you walk through the barn, you should see the cow's tails just hanging comfortably down. If their tails, even after defecation for a period of time, are, are still raised, Keep a lookout for uterine infection or gut irritation. Keep an eye out for those. Heat stress, when the cows are panting, decreased rumination, drooling, slug feeding and sorting. And I tell you what, I've seen heat stress cows will slug feed and sort harder than any cows I've ever seen before. Keep an eye on that because that's going to influence what the manure looks like as well forage becomes important. But what we found is when we fed more high quality forage during heat stress, didn't look like we lost any more milk, but the animals were in better shape with fewer hoof problems and so forth than when we didn't. So I tell you what, at the end of the day, in context, when you're walking through a herd, you put all of the pieces together. You don't look at one thing and then throw up red flags or red herrings you add the information together. What does the manure look like? Fecal particle size, undigested feed, rumination of the cows, at least 50% of them not eating, sleeping in heat or such should be ruminating. Um, what is their eating behavior? Slug feeding, sorting? What is the overall health of the animals? Their production, their efficiency, their environment, their management, and all of the other things you see as you actually walk out amongst the herd and confer between that and the other records. And you use those to build a case as to what ration or management changes are needed or not to meet the goals of the herd for productive, efficient, healthy animals. And so with that, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. The heat of summer is coming, and it can have a big impact on your cows. Niacher Precision Release Niacin is the perfect complement to traditional heat abatement strategies to help keep her cool from the inside. Using Balcom's proprietary encapsulation process, 
Niacer delivers eight times more bioavailability than raw niacin, leading to an increase in sweating and vasodilation to reduce internal body temperature and support maximum productivity. Learn more at balchemanh.com cool and keep her cool from the inside. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen, but we will get started with the first question. So, Dr. Hall, your first question is, uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Hall. Uh, Hans, Hans wants to know what factors affect site fermentation, ruminal versus large intestine slash cecum? I mean, the, I, first things first, many different pieces. I mean, what is going to affect site of fermentation is how well selective retention, I mean, selective retention is going to be working in the room and, and that's where the larger particle size creating a matrix that will keep feed from just passing through that becomes very important i mean that that's where the forages tend to come in for for creating the ruminal environment to make good use of the forages to get it well buffered um through the cow saliva and, and so forth i mean when you have high producing calves. Well, now let me take it back. When you look at different levels of dry matter intake, we're going to have increasing passage as you get higher levels of intake. I mean, and going to another question that's asked about fecal pH. Um, now, mind you, the question is about whether we can use that to look at hindgut acidosis. Uh, the answer actually is no, because inadvertently no or not what you think because those pools of diarrhea took pHs on them and they were actually alkaline and, and that may be bicarb dumping in, in the hind gut when um, when the animals got diarrhea but no going back when we've taken fecal pHs on dry cows versus uh, looking at lactating cows the lactating cows had a lower fecal pH I mean, they might be in the sixes. We've seen lower than that. Um, but for the dry cows, they might be up in the sevens. And that's a function of what is the diet? How long is it being held in the rumen? And what is getting back to the hindgut to ferment is what it looks like, it is what that association appears. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is a long one, so get ready. It comes from Lauren. Um, compact feeding from Northern Europe does not provide any effective form of fiber, and yet lactation performance is good. This involved moistening and pre-mixing the dry components in eight liters of water per cow, 800 liters of water for 100 cows, before mixing these with forages for 30 minutes. The blend is soaked overnight, and the following morning this is added, along with the dry minerals to the forages. Is the effective fiber really an important parameter if attention is paid to the chemical nature of the fibers? There are lots of different ways to do things. Um, there's an experiment that Larry Chase and I did. Larry is emeritus at Cornell University uh, where, okay, in 2012, we had a drought that reduced the amount of forage that we had available. And so we took the forage in the diet down to 40%. We didn't add any corn grain. We didn't add soybean meal. We had byproducts. We had like 11% starch. Um, the cows did all right. Okay, all right. Uh, they were late lactation animals and we were still holding, I'm thinking somewhere around 75 pounds of milk production. But I was getting concerned about the energy that we had there. I mean, what it, what it ended up looking like in the work that I've done over the years is that the amount of starch you feed is going to affect what level of forage you need to feed to keep animals healthy. Um, more, more than other components is my, more than other non-fiber carbohydrate components is my impression. I mean, in, in that question, there was another piece that talked about adding the, the soaked material to forages. 
And, and so you know, ruminants were designed for, designed to, to run on forages. So I would be curious to have more information about the particle size and the percentage of those forages in the diet and so forth before I'm ready to buy that there's not effective fiber there. But, but I guess what I'm telling you, too, is that the rest of the diet is going to have influence on how much forage, on how much effective fiber you need to feed to be able to keep the cows healthy and productive. Um, I'd also be interested in looking at the feed efficiencies because if material isn't held in the rumen to be digested, especially the fiber, the cow isn't going to get the nutrients out of that that she might otherwise, but it depends what it depends if other things can or balance. So I haven't answered your question, <laughs> but but there are a lot of different factors that that come to bear for understanding what might be optimal under different circumstances. And, and it still goes back to the point: the cows are the only ones that are always right, and it's figuring out what how we work with them with these different situations um, to get what we want. Excellent, excellent. Next question, uh, Julie wants to know your recommended TMR dry matter percent to reduce sorting and optimize dry matter intake. It, I mean, you, the general recommendation is not to go with, with fermented feeds, not to go over 50% of moisture in the diet and that might be as much related to um, to the fermentation products that are in the silage and maybe reducing bunk stability, reducing dry matter intake and so forth. Um, you know, part of it, and, and by the way, I, I've worked with molasses a fair bit. I've received funding from um, Westway Feeds LLC. Um, so, you know, full disclosure, I, I've worked with molasses. I mean, think about things like molasses or other liquid feeds that can make the diet stickier. Or, or, or back in the day, we used to use wet brewer's grains. Um, if you can add material that will help literally hold the diet together and you have the right particle size, I mean, an inch to two inches long, go back to Lou Armentano's comment, shorter than a cow's mouth is wide. Okay, for particle size. If you can hold the diet together and make it harder for the cow to sort, um, combine that with what you want to do for moisture content and see where it falls out. But but again, unless it's it's straight fresh, like green chop, um, fifty percent would be the upper limit, and below that you go where you need to to get the quality of diet, the texture of diet um, that you want, and then watch what the cows do with it. Over the course of the day, especially if the material starts to dry out and at one end of the day they can sort and earlier they couldn't. Cows have a lot of time on their on their hopes. Right. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. So uh, next one is from Diego. Uh, can we use manure pH to determine hindgut acidosis? If so, which pH would be normal and which would indicate acidosis? And, and that goes back to, to my comment earlier. Um, when I've looked at, when I've looked at, you, know, you, you got to ask yourself, how does, how does this researcher spend her time? Yeah, spend a lot of time with pH probes and, and manure. Um, the... The diarrhea, the, the few cases of diarrhea that I've taken a pH on, the, the pH was more alkaline, which isn't what you'd expect. On research studies with manure that look perfectly normal, I have gotten some lower pH. And, and what you do is you take a sample of the manure, you take a pH probe, you put it into that manure swirl it around a bit to be able to get good contact and just read it like that. If you add water to it, you start to change the pH of the manure or the pH that you record. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know that besides 
very alkaline on diarrhea. Uh, I'm not sure that pH will give you a good handle on hindgut acidosis. And I know that sounds weird, um, but that's been my experience. I, what I've done is I've typically more looked at what kind of texture do we have going on? I mean, the diarrhea, the foam, et cetera, to get an idea of is material fermenting in the hindgut. There's been a fair amount of work with beef cattle where they found that things like calcium carbonate fed to beef cattle modified hindgut pH. And so that affected what they thought the impact of the diet was. I don't think we've explored interpretation of pH relative to what that means to the cow. I don't think we've explored it as well as we might. Well, and speaking of foam, your next question is from Margaret. And she says, when you do a manure screen, if you see an excessive amount of bubbles and foam come off the screen, what would you conclude? I would want, okay. The, and this will go with, I think, another question that's there. Um, somebody was asking about a fixed amount of material. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer both together. If you've got a lot, if what I try to do is I get the same, try to get the same amount of manure from, from cow pie to cow pie to cow pie, um, because when you rinse that through, the amount of material that's left is going to reflect how much that other brown microbial endogenous secretion matrix uh, was there, how much gas and so forth. And the more of that that's there, the less solids you'll retain. If I have, if I see a lot of foam coming off, um, part of it depends on the water pressure of the hose that I'm using <laughs> and, and how, I'm, yeah, I've done a lot of this um, and how that's spraying. It, I have not looked at it as something of concern. I mean, there, there's there's a whole lot of microbial matrix and as I say, endogenous secretions in manure um, that could add to foam. I'm not sure I've seen it as a problem. The You get to that point kind of mid-step when you're rinsing the manure, um, but it typically goes down as you get rid of more and more of that um, as you're using your hand to, your gloved hand, to, to wipe around the inside of the screen to clear it so the material can go through. Okay. Um, our next question is, how long does it take to restore intestinal health or, or epithelial health after viral diarrhea? I don't know. Okay, that was a quick answer. <laughs> and, and quite honest. At, we, we need some good veterinary gastroenterologists to chat with to, to get at some of these, and I'm not sure they have all the answers either. Okay. Paula says, um, I could be a ratio, what could be the ratio of RD starch to forage NDF, to forage NDF, a suitable indicator to optimize retention time and reduce hindgut fermentation. So could RD starch to forage NDF be a suitable indicator. Okay, if you go to the new dairy nutrient well, nutrient requirements of dairy cattle, and okay, my my book is over on the other table. Um, there is a table in there that lists recommended forage NDF relative to starch, and it gives it gives some guidelines for how much starch relative to how much forage. And what you find is forage goes down. Um, thank you so much. Um, I tell you what, can you go and find the one table? Clay, could you find the one table in there in the carbohydrate section that, um, that gives the NDF versus uh, starch? Would you be sure. so kind? I will thank check, you. yes. Okay, but because there are recommendations out there and I don't have them committed to memory. Uh, one of the things that you get to look at, um, and, and by the way, I appreciate that you put it in terms of room degradable starch, because what's in the book only has starch. There are gonna be different responses 
depending on the degradability of the starch. I mean, you know, finely ground grain, steam flaked corn, slightly more coarsely ground grain, um, drier corn grain in the corn sides. There we go. Um, there are some things that we do not have strict guidelines for that as a nutritionist, you're going to need to walk the herd, see the animal's response, and adjust accordingly for your particular situation. Um, what's in the, the 2021 NASEM book on nutrient requirements of dairy cattle on that page um, would give you a starting point. Thank you. Excellent. And we can share that page number and possibly even a screen capture of that in the notes so that you can read that because I couldn't read that. I need my glasses, I guess. Um, the next question comes in from Rodrigo. Dr. Hall, should we consider to reduce the use of starch and substitute with other sources of carbohydrates to avoid hindgut fermentation? Everything's a matter of balance. By the way, I like that question. Um, okay, for the record, so the rest of you don't feel bad, I've liked all the questions so far. Um, there had been some work that went after the point that there is not a starch requirement for the cow. What there can be is a digestible or a fermentable material requirement for the cow. And so, you know, that again, that one study that Larry Chase and I did, we cut down to about 11% starch and, and did not see except for energy issues, which I think we're potentially getting into. Um, no problem per se. Uh, I think that, again, we haven't fully explored how we work with different non-fiber carbohydrates to meet a cow's needs. I mean, some of the recommendations that are out there now, if you have enough forage in the diet, and again, I go back to the Mason book and I like what's there, and no, that's not just because I was on the committee. Um, the current recommendations that are out there might be five to maybe five percent sugars, might be seven to nine percent soluble fiber, might be twenty-two to twenty-eight percent starch. Okay, and starch I see as the the most challenging one. It's readily available. It varies greatly in its fermentability. And it might be voted most likely for how it fits with the forager feeding um, to help support excellent production on the cow's part or to create problems. Uh, what, what me and my colleagues and, and commercial dairies have been doing uh, are trying to increase the amount of high quality forage in the diet so that we make use of our land resources on the farm. We give the cow something that she was designed to work with and we support high production. And, you know, get it, I mean, 55, 60% forage. You, you then get to, you then I think have more leeway in terms of what else you can feed. I, again, I tell you, uh, I don't think we've explored some of the options for how we can mix and match, let's say, the water-soluble carbohydrates, the soluble fiber and starch, and what the interactions are with how much degradable protein do we need to feed? What kinds, what sources of degradable protein to make each of those systems work well? Um, I don't think we've explored it necessarily as well as we might. Well, we have reached the top of the hour, so we're going to close with one last question. And this is from uh, Simone from France. Have you ever met sand in manure? Any ideas where it could come from? Sand in manure, oh yeah. Um, sand in manure can come from a couple places. It, oh, or more than a couple. It could come from the feeds. The, depending what level of soil contamination that you have within them. It can come from cows, cons 
cows consuming soil. Um, as I mentioned in one of the slides, if cows are having issues with digestive upset, and I've seen it particularly with heat stress, cows may actually start devouring um, dirt. They may, may devour soil. And there's been discussion, is this related to digestive upset, a mineral deficiency, or, or whatnot? But those would be some fairly obvious candidates for what could be a substantial amount uh, of soil, of sand showing up in the manure. Um, that would be my starting, that would be where I would start to look. Wonderful. Well, we have reached the end and top of our hour. So thank you, Dr. Hall, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, we will have the recording of this uh, webinar up on the Balchem website at balchem.com slash real science within 48 hours. But if you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues on June 7th with Dr. Trevor DeVries from the University of Guelph, where he reviews how understanding dairy cow behavior is important for optimizing nutritional management. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform or visit balchem.com slash podcast. Subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and we'll send you a cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt. On behalf of Balcom and Dr. Hall, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>